Humankind seems intent on replicating itself in machine. Even if one of the principles of robotics says it should always be possible to tell a robot from a human. No longer automatons, these robots respond to random stimuli. See the toy and fetch it, a cognitive response once unthinkable. In years to come, their artificial intelligence could be adapted to help us with housework or to care for children or our elders. The technology is already here. It's ready to be deployed. The only thing that's really slowing us down in some cases is that we're not sure how it will work with society, what the legal and ethical uh, connections will be. Ibo, sit down. Well, as you can see, like real dogs, these are designed sometimes to disobey orders. And inventors keep on trying to give robots more and more ability to think and to act independently. But responsible developers have to ask themselves how to prevent them doing things we don't want, but also how to respond if they do so. Already we have cars that park themselves, but who's responsible if things go wrong? Auto driving. In a decade, cars could be driving themselves, but if there's an accident, is the owner or the manufacturer to blame? <laughs> no hands anywhere. No hands, no feet. And if robots like this are to play a role in healthcare, how do we protect patient safety? These topics have been discussed at Europe's first conference on ethics and robotics at the University of Sussex. You can't have the robots know for sure that what they do will or will not hurt a person, for example. Um, so we have to think very much about our laws. We have to think about how we safely operate. So every person who buys a robot has obligations just like a car. Another rule says robots should not be designed solely or primarily to kill or harm humans. And yet weapons makers are poised to offer unmanned aircraft that could do just that. The next generation of drones, of military robots, will have much more autonomy. In fact, it'll have the ability to take decisions whether or not to kill. They're big questions, which will take just as much intelligence to answer as the artificial intelligence which posed them. Tygen Wright, Sky News, Brighton. Well, joining us now from our central London studio is Dr. Emma Byrne, an expert in artificial intelligence AI. Dr. Byrne, welcome to you. It's, uh, I suppose, quite easy to obsess with the science fiction angle here. The truth is, where our AI is concerned, a lot of the applications are actually rather benign. They are, yes. I mean, I, for one, I'm a contact, and glass, contact lens and glasses wearer. Um, yeah, and I've know. got an appointment in a, a week or so to go and get my eyes done with laser surgery. Um, and I'm quite confident of the fact that um, the entire thing from assessing the shape of my eye through to sticking the lasers on it will be done by a computer. Um, but it's the kind of thing we don't tend to think of as very intelligent. You go in, you lie down underneath the machine and a surgeon in a gown is behind you and you assume that that's the person in charge. But actually it's the computer that's doing the whole thing. And, mm. and it's not very noticeable because it doesn't look like what we've seen in, in science fiction. So where do those misgivings kick in then? Uh, where, where, where do the worries principally lie and all people to be worried? Um, I think the, the worry principally lies in the fact that we're allowing machines to have autonomy. Um, and the only other things that, that we have around us that have a degree of autonomy are, are animals. So if you think of the adage of, of never work with children or animals, you could add to that in future never work with children, animals or robots because you can't entirely predict what it is that they're going to do. And is, are we sure that the evolutionary track of artificial intelligence is relentlessly upwards? There's no sense in which we're, we're banging our heads on a, on a ceiling of development. It just will continue in its inexorable rise. I think so. I see no ending um, or no end in sight to funding for things like, for example, military technologies or um, autonomous driving. Um, most of the large motor manufacturers are now putting an awful lot of money into university research here in the UK and abroad. Uh, so, for example, well, they've been talking about it for years, haven't they? I mean, you know, the driverless car was the stuff of my childhood. You don't need to know how old I am now, but it's been that story's been around for a long time. Absolutely. Um, but we've now got to the point where, for example, in the United States, the Google car actually has its own driving license. So in Nevada and California, you see the autonomous car driving itself. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I did actually see that while I was in California earlier this year. And my excitement was, was, um, was something to behold. Yeah, I'm sure it was. <laughs> now, it's the militarization 
that, that chills some people to the, to the bone, doesn't it? I mean, we were just looking at pictures of a, a fighter jet with no pilot. And you can see the temptations, you can see the attractions for a military planner. There you've got a jet that can fly and do things aerobatically, pulling enormous Gs without a pilot. You put the human being into the mix and suddenly they black out at whatever it is, nine Gs. So you can see the military applications are very attractive of robotics. Yes, and this is something that ever since I began my career in this field, so in the late 90s, early 2000s, that people have been talking about. Um, and it's good to see that, that this, um, this particular conference happened in the UK because I know it's something that we, that researchers, the research community in the UK have been leading the way in for as long as I can remember. So about 10 years ago there was something called the robotics retreat where these principles of robotics were first mooted. The idea that robots should only ever be used to harm people in the case of, of the defense of, of a nation. The, the, so I was going to say, we haven't got very long, but I was going to say, just on the point about guidelines, I mean, there was a famous, famous Isaac Asimov, wasn't the science fiction writer, who had these principles of robotics. But we don't have, do we have any universal guidelines, and indeed what agency could probably lay, actually lay them down? Yes, I'm afraid we don't. Um, and the principles that the robotics retreat came up with and the principles that were discussed in Brighton this week um, are slightly different to the Isaac Asimov laws of robotics. Um, but the problem is that we're reliant at the moment on the goodwill of the robots owners and the robots developers and manufacturers uh, to, to adhere to those principles of, of minimizing harm and making sure that we can trace who a robot belongs to, for example. It's kind of like we're in the early days of having more cars or very few cars on the road and, and very few laws to back that up. Um, okay. Over the years, we've developed things like the MOT, seatbelt laws, yeah. speed limits. We're going to see a similar, I think, increase in, in legislation, national and international, uh, to make sure that robots are deployed safely and usefully. Okay. okay. Dr. Emma Byrne, good luck with that uh, contact lens surgery, laser eye <laughs> surgery. It hurts a little bit, by the way. Thanks a lot. So I hear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. As the fog has